As a wise man once said, Well, the time has his way with us all. But when I look at Chris, Paul, I think to myself, He doesn't age. And he can't be killed. So, how is this possible? What makes him so goddamn special? What's the secret? The secret to longevity. Does anyone know? For those of modest height, life in the NBA can be tough. Taller is pretty much always better. And if you're in that six foot to six foot three range, the job market is extra crowded. At that point, speaking statistically here, you might be better off selling insurance with your dorky or twin brother. To beat those odds, at any age, in such a fiercely competitive environment, a player has to be pretty damn good. But to pummel those odds at an all-star level well into their 30s, the way Chris Paul has at age 36 with the Phoenix Suns, that is essentially a comet in hoops history. This season in 70 games, Paul posted averages of 16.4 points per game on 59.9% true shooting, 8.9 assists, and a box plus minus score of 4.7. At that size and at that age, only John Stockton in 1997 and 98 with the Utah Jazz and Steve Nash in 2009-10 with the Suns have posted seasons that were statistically similar. So what do these three players have in common? I have some ideas. As I see it, a number of non-negotiable traits need to be in play for a smaller player to perform at an all-star level this far into their career. These traits link together harmoniously like a chain, and I'm going to call this the longevity chain. The obvious place to start is health and athleticism. It bears mentioning that each of these three players were extremely careful in the management of their bodies once they hit their mid-30s. Aside from being tough as nails, Stockton often credits Utah's chiropractor in addition to focusing on a natural diet. Nash famously overhauled his diet and sleep habits, and CP3 actually went vegan after struggling with their ability during his time in Houston. For any player to hang around, you gotta stay healthy, but I think that this is especially true for smaller players. That's because a size disadvantage becomes intensified when a small player's mobility is compromised. CP3's durability has been wobbly at times, but in the past two seasons, he's been able to stay on the court. While we're on the subject, I think it gets overlooked just how exceptional Paul's starting point was as an athlete. Go back and watch the tape. When Chris was drafted in 2005 by the New Orleans Hornets, he was unbelievably fast and surprisingly explosive. And what's remarkable is that he never leaned on his speed too heavily. He came into the league with an ability to effectively change speeds. With that in mind, even with some decline, he's not in a bad spot. You can see areas where the burst, the top end speed, and the vertical pop have dipped a bit. He's not constantly turning on the afterburners to beat people in transition or unleashing combo heavy sequences to cook defenders. That gradual decline in quickness has also affected him defensively. Chris is not asked to be the on-ball defender that he once was. At about age 32, tracking from the b-ball index shows that during his second season with the Rockets, he shifted to more of an off-ball defensive role. He's functioned in that capacity ever since, and remained effective. CP is so competitive and intelligent that he's able to have an impact on the game merely by being relentlessly at the right place at the right time. He also anticipates at a high level and has phenomenally quick and accurate hands on that side of the ball. Another shared trait between Nash, Stockton, and Chris Paul is how incredibly well-rounded and impressively elevated their ball skills are. Each of them has an extremely polished and dynamic offensive skill set. By that I mean passing, handling, and scoring at an elite, efficient level. Steve Nash was a pick and roll wizard who gave us a glimpse of hoops to come and could have scored a ton more if he'd been inclined. From 1987-88 to 1996-97, John Stockton put up 10 consecutive seasons of at least 10 assists per game while scoring 15.7 points per game on 61.9 true shooting. CP3 isn't always an overtly colorful passer. He's much more of a playmaking technician, but the placement of his passes and the consistency of his decision making helps Phoenix string together sequences where they're getting a good shot much more frequently than last season. From last season to this one, they've seen significant leaps in the efficiency of their cutting game, their spot ups, and in the pick and roll. Most impressive for me is the fact that he's been able to continue to score at a high level. I mean, I know who I am, I can score. CP3 has middle game, he's lethal shooting off the catch. However, any discussion about his scoring repertoire that doesn't zero in on his mid-range game is really stupid. 
When it comes to dribble pull-ups, Chris Paul is a monster, and a lot of these shots have come in the pick and roll. Over the years, when Chris Paul has dribbled off of a screen, you can clearly see that his own offense has shifted from attacking the basket and getting to the line to probing the coverages in the middle of the floor and either shooting or kicking to Phoenix's shooters. Luckily, the evolution of space in the modern game has lined up nicely for this shift in his shot selection to happen. Check out the spacing from the 2008-2009 season. Compare that to today, where the space enables him to consistently do something that we call snaking the pick and roll. Snaking the pick and roll has become a popular maneuver for ball handlers in the past 10 years, but nobody's handled the snake quite like CP3. This is how it goes down. The handler takes a ball screen and dribbles off of it, and instead of continuing to head in that direction, they reverse course and dribble between the screen defender and the on-ball defender, who is now, ideally, behind them. Chris is set up to do this well because he navigates tight space as well and he can keep his dribble low, but he seems to really prefer taking a left ball screen and snaking it back to the right. According to Second Spectrum, no player has snaked more ball screens in the past four seasons than Chris Paul, and this season, no player has attempted more dribble jumpers from the right elbow area, which is where he's trying to go. He shot an insane 51.4% from that spot. He is masterful at creating separation and side hopping to get to this shot. And if the screen is high and the big drops too much, he'll dribble straight into it and blam. If the screen is meh and the on-ball defender gets over the top to stop him from going right, like Colin Sexton does here, he'll lean into him and hop left and blam. But my favorites are when he forces an especially big five to backpedal for a moment and then shuffle clumsily towards him as he takes a huge hop into his fadeaway. In this context, CP3 is the teacher, and you'd better listen. This will be on the final. This ability to be dynamic sets up the next critically important trait, and that's IQ and pace. Basketball is a rhythm sport, and the ability to dictate pace is something that separates good from great players. The more polished and well-rounded a player's ball skills are, the more set up they are to command the pace of the game. And when brilliant players like John Stockton, Steve Nash, Chris Paul have the ability to play with pace, the more able they are to fully weaponize their basketball minds. But every piece has to be there for it to work. If a player is a terrific driver and passer but they can't shoot, it's harder to dictate pace. If a dude is a terrific shooter but just an okay handler, just an okay passer, it's harder to dictate pace. And when a smart, dynamic player is enabled to play with pace, the penalties of declining athleticism are rendered less severe. You then have a player who has role malleability, capable of switching between dependable score and high-level playmaker at will. This makes it extremely difficult to take away a player's contributions. A welcome byproduct of being this consistently balanced and impactful is that you become a floor-raising player and contribute to a lot of winning over a long period of time. Nash, Stockton, and Paul have cumulatively played 53 total seasons, and between the three of them, they've only missed the playoffs six times. CP3 accounts for three of those, and that's one bullet point on a resume that was wildly impressive from the jump. Chris Paul started by delivering arguably the greatest rookie point guard season of all time in 2005-2006, back when games were in 4-3 aspect ratio and Shakira was reminding us that hips are in fact truthful. In the following seasons, he became an 11-time All-Star, an All-NBA First Teamer four times, and he made First Team All-Defense seven times. He's also fifth on the all-time list in assists and steals, and he's closing in on 20,000 career points. That's a resume of sustained excellence that gives him immense credibility to balance his complex reputation as a demanding teammate. For the Phoenix Suns, a young team that has been searching for solidified identity, that has been incalculably huge. You know, Chris's ability to orchestrate and play and pick and roll, I wish it was X's and O's, but it's, it's just, just his ability to carry a team in those moments and, and he gives everybody a lot of confidence. I say incalculable, but the numbers are visibly there. The addition of CP3 and an improved roster has helped them improve their record from 34 and 39 and missing the playoffs a season ago to 50 and 21 and the two seed in the playoffs this season. He's enabled Devin Booker to thrive off the ball. He's given them another dependable late game shot creator. And overall, he's just injected a toughness and a confident poise into their personality because they trust him. We got Chris Paul in Phoenix. You know, from on the court to off the court, just everything he does, you know, I'm a sponge to it. 
CP3 has entered a phase of his career where he's operating like one of those CEOs who joins a cool startup and guides them as they take their company public. Young cores are undeniably fun, but to level up, it helps to have a respected veteran in the room who can pipe up and ask, Can we get serious? Ironically, Chris Paul's influence has helped Phoenix shift away from the Valley Boys persona and has led them out of the Valley. Now, I will grant you that Chris Paul's popularity has been up and down over the years, in some ways understandably. And I know what you're thinking. After all that longevity and all that impressive production, no, Chris Paul does not have a ring. And in the lonesome, crowded West, it's going to be epically difficult for Phoenix to get him one in the 2021 playoffs. And hey, untimely elephant in the room here, to have him go down minutes into game one of their series against the Lakers is a brutal bad beat for the Suns. For full transparency, that injury hadn't happened as I was originally finishing this up. But I don't think that that should distract you from how unusual and how special it is for him to be doing what he's done and what he hopefully continues to do. All hail the point God. Hoops praise be to he. Let me know if you agree.